Hello, my name is Marjorie Wildcraft, and I uh, do a lot of blogging over at GrowYourOwnGroceries.org. And um, I often talk about and write about and do some videos on primitive skills gatherings that I attend. And I've had a lot of people ask me just, what the heck is that all about? So this year when I attended, uh, I went ahead and took a lot of photos and uh, do a quick presentation here. Now this one that I, I like, I go to several, and this is one that I go to. It's run in the third week of February, and it's about an hour south of Phoenix out in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, this really is rough, uh, dry, it's a desert. <laughs> it's tough country. Uh, this is a saguaro cactus. This is very in indigenous to this area. Uh, the ocotillo and the barrel cactus uh, and the teddy bear cactus. Those things look so cute, but I promise you, you don't even want to get near them. Those things hurt like crazy. Uh, so yeah, mostly a lot of chaparral and a lot of sand and not much. But, as I said, the third week in February, a camp gets set up, and um, and then this amazing primitive skills gathering happens. This one is organized by a group called Backtracks, and they're located at backtracks.net, and they're the, the bring in all the equipment and organize and set everything up, and the, it's also done in cooperation with the Society of Primitive Technology. And most of it is actually organized and coordinated and founded and run by this one man here. His name is David Westcott. And the history of this back uh, is uh, David actually organizes several of these a year. But about um, 26 or 27 years ago, he used to operate and run and own a primitive skills school, a wilderness survival school. And he and his instructors wanted to trade skills with other instructors from other schools, so he organized a gathering for them to all get together to swap and trade and learn from each other. And here we are, 26 years later, that those gatherings are still continuing on, and a, a very significant number of the people who attend this are the instructors at some of the most premier wilderness survival schools in the U.S., uh, all kinds of people show up, though, and it's not just instructors, but, um, you know, some people backpack in, and there's other people with some minimalist camping, and then just about every kind of campsite. Shade is definitely at a premium, so if you can bring a, an easy up like this, this is starting to become deluxe. Uh, trees are hard to come by. This Jeep is going to help out with the hammock there. And, uh, of course, we've got a whole assortment of teepees that managed to show up at the gathering. And we go on up from there. There's yurts and uh, uh, all different kind of little travel trailers and campers, and vans. Pretty much any way that you want to come in, you'll be welcome. Even if you're going to drive in with something like this, that's perfectly fine. And then, of course, there's a few things we can't quite categorize. <laughs> this gypsy wagon is so cute. After you've gotten your camp set up and you're registered and settled in, on Sunday afternoon they have an opening circle. And this is where uh, a lot of welcoming is done and some basic guidelines for how the camp is going to be run. Uh, later on that evening, there'll be a special uh, gathering just for newcomers so that they can all get to know each other. But this is where they're going to start doing introductions for um, instructors who are going to be teaching. And so that way you can get a, a, get a start to get an idea of what you might want to do that week. Uh, different instructors will stand up and just do a quick announcement of who they are and what they'll be teaching. And then a lot of them, will they'll set up in a big circle and lay out on a blanket their materials, and then they'll be available for you to talk to them about what they're going to be teaching and what's coming up and, and give you a taste for what's coming. Some of the classes are very small and intimate just because, you know, like to make a bow. Uh, a good boyer can only handle a group of, of four or five students at a time, and it's, a, it's going to take you about a week to do it, so there's special sign-ups for that. Uh, and each instructor does it slightly differently. Um, most of the classes are free, although there are some going to be some minimal charges if uh, you need to for materials. Uh, and as you can see by the quality of, of some of these things, uh, the, the instructors that are coming are really quite talented, and uh, you know it's just an extraordinary gift that they're spending their time to teach other people and show them how uh, to do these, how to create these things and how to share these skills. There's some brain tanning and making your own leather. 
uh, of cordage and weaving. Fiber works very important. Um, making working with stone tools and making stone knives and sheaths. <laughs> Not all the instructors are bearded old gray men. <laughs> These young girls are actually working with nettles, and they'll be, they're will be they going to be participating. They're helping their mom teach a class on nettles, uh, which is a very useful plant for eating, as well as medicine and cordage. That's an incredible plant. Uh, these are materials brought in for carving and uh, all kinds of pottery, different types of potteries, and working with leather, making shoes. Uh, there's a class where you'll use these recycled materials and turn them into sandals. Uh, here's a class on uh, working with buckskin and how to make pouches and bags and clothing and then the kids on uh, how to make toys. Jim comes in and he often uh, teaches classes for kids on bows and arrows and making quivers. And then here's a uh, you know, please don't expect to be able to make this kind of arrowhead on your first trip out to the napping pit where you're breaking rock. But uh, again, this is another testament to the quality of the instructors that are coming. This is some phenomenal, phenomenal flint napping here. And uh, might seem a little bit strange uh, out in the Sonoran Desert, but uh, you can learn how to make a skin-on kayak. Uh, spoon carving comes up. These are some amazing and amazing spoons that uh, the instructor has has done to show what's possible. And not everything is from uh, the Stone Age, and uh, lots of useful and functional things. Here are some backpacking stoves that you can make out of cat food cans, and here's a way to make cook stoves from 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 other recycled materials. A class on, of course, making bows. And uh, we have lots and lots of medicine men and women who show up and lots of classes on different ways to make medicines. Basket weaving is another, another class. And here you can see a whole lineup of blankets of different things that are available that you can walk by and see and sign up with and get to talk to the instructor and get to know them. Gourds and um, pictographs and making paints just from different rocks and making brushes out of agave stems. All sorts of jewelry. Now you're going to get overwhelmed and don't worry about it. They're going to put the schedule up for the whole week in a in a bulletin board that you can go by and check. And also announcements are made uh, at the morning meals and throughout the days of what classes are going on. Now, the dress at, at, uh, at the, the Primitive Skills is not, it's not a dress-up or a fantasy-type thing, but a lot of people make their own buckskin clothing or they make their own clothing and they aren't going to be able to wear them in too many other places, so they love to wear it here. So it's not per se a dress-up thing, but, you know, a lot of people do. It's definitely not a costume event. There's definitely no nudity and there is no alcohol or drugs. So this is really a family oriented event that's focused on on sharing and uh, sharing of skills. One thing that everybody does wear though it usually is a knife and uh, you'll see knives of just about every size and style uh, out there. Pretty creative. There's also knife making classes and sheath making classes for you to be able to make these and how to put an antler handle on a blade uh, and fancy knives, and then just simple, good old-fashioned, or, you know, Mora knives are, are certainly just a fine standard knife. Now, you're, the, uh, even kids also wear and use knives, and, um, you know, there really just isn't a problem with that. When kids are taught how to use it, uh, they are treated with respect, and uh, they seem to get along just fine. Now, you're going to use those knives. That's one of the reasons everybody's wearing one is because it's an extremely useful tool. Almost everybody learns how to make fire in one form or another, and there are lots and lots of different classes on how to make fire. Lots of different instructors and techniques. There's the classic bow drill set. And um, someone is Tom Wax, I believe, brought in these materials showing different type of tinder materials that work well. Uh, Tobias here is teaching a couple of young girls on how to how to start a hand drill fire. Uh, classes on everything, tracking. And then uh, here's Tom Wax showing a, uh, a small group how to do a Paiute deadfall. There's a little close-up of it. And after you've 
caught that um, mouse or that ground squirrel, <laughs> the folks over at Desert Dawn will show you how to dry that meat and uh, how to process it. There's usually quite a few animal processing classes that, that occur, and these, again, a lot of them are hands-on. Um, many, many healers and medicine people come. This is Kat Farneman, who teaches uh, quite a few uh, herbal classes and uh, also has materials available to purchase. And again, several different potters and potteries, and they do this the old way. They make a pit and burn a, uh, burn a lot of wood and fire it in the ground. There's uh, usually several different classes and different techniques for how to do that that happen. And uh, here's a group of teens. Several areas are designated and, uh, you know, taped off that are weapons ranges. <laughs> There's not firearms, though, but it's for atlatls and archery. Here's a group of teens that are just having a ball at the atlatl range. And uh, somebody built a, a mastodon <laughs> that they're having fun throwing darts at. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's also just traditional targets, too. And uh, it's not just the teens that love this and have a good time with it. Everybody seems to like throwing out laddles. The archers aren't left out. There's definitely a good amount of archery going on. And they have a lot of fun competitions happening during the week. It's, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, prizes and different games to play. It's, it's a lot of fun. I met this woman, Bonnie, who had just picked up a bow and arrow for the first time that week and fell in love with it. And she says, now I've got a new hobby. And she was just so delighted to, to have found and discovered this. And I hope you notice uh, in these photos, uh, and this is a classic one, this is a bow making class. And I, I don't know if these three gentlemen are all related, but you can see three generations here. And that's really typical in a lot of these classes. And you see the kids and the adults and then the elders all working together and sometimes it's a little hard to know who the instructor is. Here's another, some folks getting some tips on a bow making class. Arrows, of course, wouldn't be the same without, bows wouldn't be anything without arrows. Uh, classes on working with cattails for either making mats or making hats or weaving or baskets. And uh, here is here is Cody Lundeen, and he's giving a presentation. Not, as you know, some th most most things are hands-on in workshops, but some of them just are presentations. And Cody is giving a presentation on uh, signs of water in the desert and how you could find water by looking around and what what to notice or what to look for. Uh, Cody is pretty well known for being on the um, the survival show du Dual Survivor. I think he did a couple of seasons with them. Uh, and uh, the, the guy who took it up from him, Matt Graham, also attends this gathering pretty regularly. In fact, a lot of the instructors are used, uh, have been used by Discovery or Nat Geo or the History Channel on uh, different shows like No Man's Land or Naked and Afraid or, you know, This Survivor or That Survivor. Um, yeah, again, you know, these uh, really are some of the, the best in the, in the United States and, and internationally that come and, and gather here. Uh, this is Janet, who we affectionately call the Gourd Lady from Hell. And she comes every year with a huge truckload of gourds and shows everyone that would, is interested how to take these useful plants and turn them into all sorts of things, like bowls or masks or artwork or uh, uh, vases. This uh, young man is doing some, some really good work here. Hide tanning and uh, working and creating leather, taking a, a deer skin from, uh, you know, its rough state right off the, the deer's back into turning it into buckskin. Uh, several fine hide tanners come and teach different techniques for doing that. Uh, this man here without the shirt is Digger, and he lives up in Montana most of the year, very primitively. He only comes into civilization on a a few occasions, and he usually comes to gatherings like this to teach and, and also to trade. Uh, and uh, yeah, he really uh, is, is mostly out in the wilderness for most of the year. Here he's showing how to make uh, deer, deer hides. Uh, someone 
came in, I think his name is Ben, came in from the Pacific Northwest and shows people how to tan salmon skins. So as I said, a lot of different techniques. Red Lufish is another tanner that shows up and he also has an amazing uh, techniques for tanning deer hides. Once you've tanned some deer hides, this lovely young woman, Wonia, she is an organic farmer when she's not at a primitive skills gathering, but she's also very passionate about buckskin. And she's written a book all about how to make clothing out of buckskin. And she'll teach you the ins and outs of, of what stitches to use. And buckskin is really an extraordinary material. It is nothing like cloth. It is so much more durable and strong. It's it's quite an amazing material. Monia knows all the ins and outs of dyeing and taking care of it and cleaning. And uh, she's just an amazing woman. So classes go on everywhere, and some of them are medium-sized. Uh, some of them are, uh, oh, this one is um, um, uh, how to make pine needle baskets. Uh, just pretty much anywhere. Anybody can grab some shade. <laughs> this little fellow is uh, playing with his toys while his mama's nearby working on a project, and she was singing songs that he was listening to while he was playing and she was working. Some of them are a lot bigger. This is Bill. He teaches the... The uh, spoon carving class, and uh, had a huge class this time, I think, with uh, 30 or 40 people in it. Um, more, just as I said, lots of classes going on. This is Tom Cook. Tom comes uh, every year, and he has a bunch of friends who are duck hunters. He's a duck hunter himself, and they, they, he gets them to clean out their freezers and he teaches a class on processing ducks and then they cook all the ducks they put them on these staves roast them over the central fire and then he offers uh, uh, ducks for lunch for anybody who wants to eat it and after the ducks are eaten we take all the carcasses and put them together and cook them for the next day and turn them into soup and here I'm helping Tom make that soup and tending the fire for the for the duck soup, which is another lunch for anyone in the community who wants it the next day. And as I said, any any shade tree in Arroyo is a great place to hold a class. Soap making is a is another another nice one to participate in. And I would be totally remiss if I didn't talk about the flint napping pit. And this is the area where you learn to break rocks and turn them into arrowheads or knives or scalpels or whatever edge you might need. And this is one of the original techniques that uh, way, way, way back in our ancestry was, was common knowledge. The lovely Robin Blankenship runs the Earthnack School up in Crestone, Colorado for most of the year. And when she comes to winter count, she runs the kids' side of things. Some of the classes, uh, you know, the, the, the kids are just a little bit, there's a younger community that's just a little bit too young that don't, don't want to participate in, in the more of the adult classes. And so Robin runs a whole program for them. And they have a fantastic time doing a lot of the same stuff, but just geared down a little bit for them. And in fact, actually, I used to attend the kids' classes because it was more my speed <laughs> than the adult classes. But as you can imagine, the kids have a great time there at camp. This little feller's just so, oh, he's had just about enough, and he looks like he's hungry. And I bet you're wondering about how to eat there, yeah? Well, they set up a, a big mess tent, and they have a dedicated crew that prepares uh, breakfast and dinner. You're, you're on your own for lunch. Maybe you can grab a duck from Tom, or there are sometimes vendors that come and sell a bit of lunch, or maybe you pack some in, or you can just rough it and wait till dinner. But they serve breakfast and dinner, and uh, they'll set up these tables and serve this food. And once the conch shell is blown, generally they serve the entire camp, which this year was probably around 500 people in about 20 or 30 minutes. And you'd better get there and get your plate full and get loaded up because uh, it, they don't they don't they don't mess around. <laughs> they get it done. So you'll grab your plate and um, grab a, a lot of people sit around the central fire and just start munching down any spot that you can find will work out. You need to bring your own plates and your own utensils and mugs and things like that. 
uh, to eat out of, and you'll see an incredible assortment of different ways that people put food onto plates. Uh, and when you get done, there's an area that's set up for washing. So you wash and clean your own, uh, uh, you know, forks and utensils and eating setup. Since most of camp is gathered for breakfast and, and dinner, uh, that's also a time right after the meals when they do general announcements. In the morning, they'll do an announcements of what classes are going to go on that day. Uh, they'll be, and then in the evening, there'll be announcements of what kind of activities are, are set up for, for that evening. Uh, there'll be other announcements, uh, maybe lost and found or ride share or other things that are pertinent to the, uh, the whole community. A lot of times uh, the announcement might be to remember to drink water. This is the Sonoran Desert and it's very dry. Now water, water is brought in with these, we call them the water buffaloes, and you can come here and uh, fill up your water bottles. And most people, that's the way where we're getting our drinking water for camp from. Uh, everything is brought in and they bring in a couple of cords of wood and this is wood that's used for the main fire. It's also used for pottery firing and then if you want to have a fire by your camp you can and uh, you'd get wood from this big wood stack. It's the in the central part of camp. I knew you were asking and curious. <laughs> this is not the funnest part, but this is how they handle waste and uh, porta potties. So, uh, you know, after classes, before dinner, after dinner, the kids and almost everybody is getting involved with different kind of games. So games are happening, uh, cooperative games, sometimes tag, cops and robbers. Uh, here's a real fun kind of balanced tug of war game that uh, everybody likes to play. Um, unusual things show up that you can try. <laughs> there's a unicycle. And then every now and then there's this the element skateboard team arrives and they find scraps of wood or whatever in the desert. I don't know where they come up with this stuff and they just creatively build ramps out of the wood pile and whatever they got and they start doing all these tricks and um, uh, showing people how to skateboard and they get they, they often give out skateboards and t-shirts to all the all the kids and have a great time. Um, we're not totally sure how that's related to paleolithic skills, but um, as I said, it's an inclusive group. <laughs> they, well, they're welcome. They're fun. They're a fun group. As you would expect, drumming. Um, drumming goes on, and there's some drumming classes and uh, some amazingly wonderful rhythms that happen. Uh, and of course, dancing usually goes along with the drumming. And I would not personally attend an event that didn't have shopping. <laughs> so if you've got a blanket and you've got something you want to sell or trade, lay it out there. And uh, usually in the afternoons, uh, you're more than welcome to do a bit of business. All kinds of things show up. And kids even get involved with it. doesn't have to be a grown-up thing. Mike Powell here sets up a whole little building and has uh, its... Uh, uh, it's called the Abo Mart, and it's a, sort of like a trade shop, uh, a trade area. Um, someone, I don't know who this is, but it's absolutely delightful, goes around throughout the year and picks out wool clothing that they find from different thrift shops and gathers it up and sells it here on a blanket for just a few dollars over what they bought it at the thrift shop for. And this community really likes and appreciates wool. There's a saying around camp that cotton kills. And uh, since most of these people are, are spend a lot of time outdoors in all kinds of weather, believe me, they know, and they really appreciate wool clothing. So this is a service. Uh, I'm not sure who does it, but it really is a service for the whole community. <laughs> this is Rob. I said, Rob, I'm going to be putting this up on the Internet. Don't be so silly, but he doesn't care. He always has a neat little store there. And more, more ways to, to buy and sell and trade. And then again, here's another shop with just a lot of different blankets and, and ways to peruse around and, and look at what's available. Lots of medicine and mead and a uh, bit of honey. Now the sun's going to start setting and uh, the fun's not over yet. <laughs> and I don't exactly have a nighttime camera to capture all of this, but I'll show you a little bit. Uh, one of the most fun things is on Thursday evening is a mask night. They build a big bonfire and everybody... 
wears a mask or face paint and dances around the fire and it's so enjoyable to see everybody really from toddlers to elders going around the circle and having a wonderful time all kinds of crazy outfits show up now other than mask night there's usually all kinds of nighttime activities there may be classes on navigating by the stars or um, how to develop your night vision or perhaps a slideshow of uh, someone who went on an amazing trip recently. Um, David Holliday talked about his trip where he went down to Mexico to visit with the Taro Umara Indians. Uh, there's a, um, a trade blanket that goes on, uh, all kinds of uh, dancing and singing, uh, all kinds of campfires and spontaneous jam groups. So it goes on for quite a while and uh, until you're absolutely exhausted <laughs> and then go back to your campsite and uh, rest for the night to wake up the next morning to do it all again. This final picture here is a group shot of the instructors. I think this is uh, from 2012. As you can see, there are a lot of instructors that show up. And again, most of these uh, folks are people that work in the industry uh, teaching uh, primitive skills or maybe rehabilitating youth or teen through some wilderness programs. Some of them are archaeologists or paleontologists. Some of them are, you know, you wouldn't think, you know, a real estate investor or, a, you know, computer programmer that just happens to be really interested in atlatls and passionate about um, brain tanning or knows some of these skills. One thing that they all share in common is, is coming together to, to share skills and to uh, pass on these traditions that are, that are what our human lineage and our human ancestry is. So in this crazy world with all this modern technology, this is a, a fun band. And uh, often uh, those of us return year after year and really deep friendships are, are formed. So there's lots of primitive skills gatherings. Here's just a couple of websites to hit up. Uh, these, these gatherings happen all over the United States, uh, Florida to Maine to Missouri to Colorado to, you know, Idaho, California, Oregon, all Arizona, obviously, all over. Uh, Backtracks.net is the one that organizes several of them. Uh, they organize three or four a year. Paleotechnics has a pretty good listing, and Holotop has a, definitely has a big listing. Yeah, they they happen at all times of the year too. So um, you know, um, it just there's bound to be one near you if you're in, at all interested, and uh, think you'd enjoy it. They they structure them a bit differently. You know, meals and classes and the number of instructors all vary from um, gathering to gathering. But uh, I think you'd enjoy any one of them that you went to. So this is Marjorie Wildcraft, and we've been talking about what it's like to attend a primitive skills gathering. I will uh, hopefully see you at one of the next ones. <laughs>